I command this mountain go. Be thou plucked up, removed, and placed into the sea. Oh, you mountain of crippling arthritis. Go. Impossible for him to walk. Listen, this is a mountain removed. Come on, Daddy. Come on. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. What do you think about it? Oh, it's wonderful. You're walking. Yes, I'm. What do you think about it? Oh, I, I don't know what to say. You're here. Yes. Amen. Amen. No more than this man couldn't walk except no, these crutches. He had to walk on this earth. Amen. Amen. This is his mountain. Hey, this is the Voice of Revival podcast. I'm your host, Chad McDonald. We're going to get started in this powerful interview on location here at Miracle Valley, Arizona. But before we do, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever it is you get your podcast. So if you're watching on Charisma Podcasting Network, Spotify, Google, Apple, wherever you get your podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Give us a five-star rating. Leave some comments below. Let us know how much, as Dr. Summerall would say, this program has built your faith, allowed you to feed your faith, and starve your doubts to death. Today... I'm with my very good friend, Paul Allen, the son of the great, late General A.A. Allen, powerful pioneer in the Voice of Healing movement, a man of faith and power, a man whom God used and anointed powerfully to bring thousands and millions into the kingdom of God and to shake the very gates of hell. Today I'm with Paul Allen. We're going to get into this interview. You don't want to go anywhere, so make sure you get ready, get subscribed, listen to this interview. God's going to bless you. Today I'm with Paul Allen, my good friend Paul. Today we're going to talk a little bit about your father's ministry and really what God has done. So. I want to welcome you, um, Paul Allen, to the Voice of Revival podcast. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I really am. And uh, I I never grow tired of talking about yeah. my mom and dad and the ministry and what they did and what I'm doing now. Yeah, for those watching and listening to the podcast that may not know, A.A. A. Allen was used powerfully in what's known as the Voice of Healing Era movement. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, even into the 70s, God shook this nation through a revelation of his miracle healing and delivering power. And A.A. A. Allen was one of the generals of the faith that God used, one of the great pioneers in that movement and in his ministry throughout the 1950s and until 1970, when God called him into his eternal reward. God used him powerfully. Every night, that tent was filled with thousands of people who would come in services three times a day, maybe sometimes more. And each night they would come encounter, encounter the power of God in a supernatural way. Blinded eyes would see, deaf ears would come unstopped, wheelchairs would be emptied, hospital beds would be emptied out. So the power of God was displayed for thousands of people to see. They would come from all over the country to many of these locations around this nation. And God used him very powerfully. We're here right now in Miracle Valley, and we're going to take some time on this podcast talking about your father and Without further ado, let's get into the interview and talk to me a little bit about who your father, A.A. A. Allen, was. He was he was the greatest dad anybody ever had, as far as I'm concerned. I people ask me all the time. Matter of fact, uh, 
I was talking to a lady on the telephone just a matter of five, ten minutes ago that I'd never met, and the one thing she asked me was, did you travel with your dad while he was on the road? And we did. We lived in a, most of the time, a 30-foot trailer house, parked it on the tent lot behind the tent. Uh, part of the time we'd have a 33 or 35 foot, but most of the time it was a 30 foot. And we traveled there. That was our home. You know, what would you say that would, that made your father different from the rank and file preacher of even today or of his day? What separated him? His dedication. He and my mother wrote a book called The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. Yeah. Um, I have that and it will be available where you can download it on the website within the next very few weeks. In answer to your question about what made him unique, yeah. is very early in his ministry, he was pastoring a church in Idaho at the time, or it might have been, been Corpus Christi, Texas, and he and a couple friends went up to either Houston or Dallas and went to an Earl Roberts tent meeting. Yeah. And during that time that they were there, they were there for, I think, three to four days. But during the time that he was there going to Oral Roberts tent meetings, he experienced the kind of Shekinah glory that very few people ever see. Even people that are there in the tent don't see yeah. everything that, that God wants them to see. They're looking around and seeing what's going on and so forth. But his, when he came out of that meeting, he said, if God can use Oral Roberts to do that, he is going to use me to do the same thing. And he went back, got, went into what mom and dad always referred to as the prayer closet. Yeah. And he said, lock it from the outside and don't unlock it for anything or anybody until I knock on the door and say, let me out. And they both went to their grave, yeah. keeping that as a secret. But God gave him a list of about 13 things that he needed to take care of in his life. And when the final thing was, some of them were taken care of before he ever came out of the closet. Yeah. Others, it was a, a period of time. But when the last one of those things that he marked off the list had been resolved between him and the Lord, was when his true calling began to come into focus. And miracles uh, of all kinds, uh, casting out demons, uh, prophesying, everything that God had promised him that he would give him and the things that he told him would be part of his ministry. Yeah. At that point became part of what he was doing and everything fell into place. And the year that he died, Look Magazine had him listed in a list that they put in the magazine of the 10 most influential yeah. people, not the 10 most influential preachers in America, the 10 most influential people on earth. And he was one of those 10. And what he did, the first time we set up a tent was in Yakima, Washington. And black people, white people, Indian people, Mexican, everybody came to the meeting and there was nobody even thought twice about the fact that they were all there together. Yeah. 
Then we went over to Boise, Idaho, had a meeting there, and it was the same way there. From there, we went to Tyler, Texas. That is considered deep south. Yeah. We found out down there that not only do people not want the different races to mix, there are written laws about it that if you do that, you can get yourself thrown in jail. Yeah. Serious type things. And the police came out and told mom and dad that you can't have these black people. They didn't call them that. Yeah. You can't have these people in this meeting with white people. If you do, we will arrest you and yeah. put you in jail. And he said, do it. If you do that, the one thing you're guaranteed is that you're going to give me a million dollars worth of free advertising and everybody in the United States will know who I am, that I'm in jail, and that I'm here because I had church. Yeah. And the Ku Klux Klan would come and try to burn it. They'd pour gas on it and set it on fire and it wouldn't burn. Come on. They'd take razors and knives and cut the tent, cut the ropes. The devil did everything yeah. within his power to try to stop daddy before he ever got a really yeah. good start. And we went from there to West Memphis, Arkansas, or West Memphis. I think that's in Arkansas, not Tennessee, if I remember yeah. right. And um, ran into the same problems down there. But daddy refused to obey the Jim Crow laws. Yeah. And what he did, plain and simple, he opened the door a crack to what ended up being the civil rights movement. Sure. And very quickly after that, Martin Luther King Jr. saw what was going on and said, if he can do that, I can, I can do what I want to do. Yeah. And people would ask Daddy, I've heard many, many, many people, more than I could ever count, ask Daddy what he thought about what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. And he would say, just bluntly, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm doing it with love. He's doing it by getting in your face. But we're going to go to the same heaven and if we can't worship together here, how are we going to do it in heaven? Yeah. And that was basically his philosophy. And what he did, and I talk about it in the book and in some other things that I've written in, that what he and mother did, they did not just change the southern part of the United States. They didn't just change the United States. Yeah. They and their ministry changed the world. Yeah, yeah, it did. Doing away with apartheid in South Africa would have never, ever happened without what Daddy had done in the United States. Yeah. And when you say, what did your dad do that's different? Everything he did was different. Mm -hmm. Um, when we got to a, a big tent, Daddy went and held a revival at the fairgrounds in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. One of the uh, pastors that was a sponsoring pastor came to Daddy and said, Brother Allen, I've got a young man in my church that is a wonderful, wonderful singer, and he's coming to every service. And I think that if you were to let him sing, you would enjoy it, and I think everybody here would enjoy it. So Daddy said, well, introduce me to him, and he did. And he said, would you sing it tomorrow afternoon's afternoon service? Yeah. He said, sure. So he came, and from then on, for the next few days, he sang in the afternoon service. And there wasn't a person in the, in the tent that wasn't tapping their toes and stomping their feet and clapping their hands and a whole lot of them getting up and dancing up and down the aisles in the, what everybody always called sawdust, but it's actually wood shavings. Yeah. And about halfway through the meeting, Daddy asked him if he'd come and sing in the night meeting. Yeah. And when we got ready to leave, Daddy hired him 
as his singer, everyone, without exception, every one of what were referred to back then as the big evangelists, yeah. and I don't need to call their names. If you know who they are, you know, and if you don't, you wouldn't recognize the name anyway. But every single, without exception, every single one of the big evangelists, uh, which also included virtually all of the evangelists that were part of the Voice of Healing yeah. Association, called, wrote, notified Daddy that if he hired Gene Martin, that his ministry would end on the day he hired Gene Martin, that he could not have him on the platform as part of the crew and get respect and have an audience that people would quit coming to his meetings. Yeah. And he would listen to them and say, well, he appreciated their opinion and he was glad that they were willing to give him their opinion, but that he had talked to God about it and he was going to listen to God instead. That's the only one that matters. And he hired him. He worked for him till the day Daddy died. Yeah. Um, I've been to several of his meetings. I've taken part in some after Daddy died, uh, taken part in several of them, um, taken a lot of pictures of him. I'm a photographer. Um, he was an incredible man. Yes, yes. You know, you were talking about how your dad was a pioneer, really in racial reconciliation in the nation. And a lot of people really only think about him as being a pioneer in the healing and the miracle movement, but he was very instrumental in bringing the races together, especially in the deep south, at the expense of much persecution that he had had to endure because he bucked those those systems and that and those systems of those ungodly laws and said, I'm going to preach the gospel. And I believe that God's not a respecter of person. And so he was really a pioneer in that sense. He was the person that started the civil rights movement, period. I mean, he was one of the, he was the person that started it. And then Martin Luther King Jr., daddy opened the door a little bit, yeah. Martin Luther Jr. kicked it wide open. Yeah. And from there on, um, it was, what they did was change the world. You know, it's important because I'm reminded when you talk about that, I'm reminded of Acts 17:6. And that scripture there tells us that the people of the town, when Paul came, they were so upset and they cried out and said, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. Paul had a track record that everywhere he went, he turned the system of the enemy upside down. He shook cities with the power of the gospel. And that's the kind of anointing that your father walked in. When he came to many of these cities and, and counties and, and locations and put up that great gospel tent that's so beautifully displayed on that tomb, tombstone behind us that would seat thousands of people. It literally created a fervor in the community and people wanted to come out and experience it. You know, the Bible tells us that when they had heard of Jesus, his fame was spread throughout all of Syria. Well, when they had heard of the ministry of your father, faith began to come alive in so many people's hearts because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, like Paul said, not with the eloquency of the wisdom of men, but in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And he believed that God was the same today. Jesus Christ was the same today as, as he was yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow. And so people came from all over, all over the country. They would drive and, and pack these tents out, and they would come with an expectancy to encounter God, and they needed, desperately many of them, need a, needed a miracle. And there were so many miracles that happened under that tent. We're sitting in original chairs that sat under that tent. And you were so gracious to send our ministry one of those. And I often think when I pray alongside that, that chair, I'm reminded of the thickness and the richness of the anointing that was in that ministry under that tent. And that's available to us even right now. Let's talk a little bit about the miracles and the power of God that was displayed that you witnessed growing up under the tent so regularly. Well, it was not uncommon to pull up to the tent 
and around behind it, kind of off to the side a little bit and behind it, see anywhere from three or four to five or six or even 15 or 20 ambulances yeah. lined up in rows out there mm. where people that wanted to get healed and they couldn't go walk out and get in the car. They were bedridden, they were in the hospital and and they would hire an ambulance to literally bring them to church. And then the majority of the time those ambulances went home empty. That's right. Glory to God. It, it, it wasn't something that happened once or twice and everybody was astonished. It happened every night. In, in my book, one of the questions I am always asked if I go to a church and speak and I do question and answer type things and have somebody walk around with a wireless mic and I answer their questions. And one of the questions I always get asked, I, I don't think I've ever been to a church or an auditorium where we were doing it, where this was not a question that was asked. Yeah. They say, what's the most incredible miracle that you ever personally saw? And so when I wrote my book about growing up in the Allen home, I wrote one chapter, and the, the lead of the chapter is what was the most incredible miracle yeah. you ever saw. And I tell about three miracles in that. The first one is my brother John. He was two years older than I am. He's now gone on for his reward. But as a teenager, we all had jobs that we did in yeah. the tent, both as a setup crew and the breakdown crew, but also on a daily basis that we did on routine. I was a still photographer and I still am a still photographer. My brother John wanted to run a TV camera and he was on a scaffold on the back of the platform that was about 10 feet high. Wow. They rolled a stretcher. The lady had been brought there f directly from the hospital to the tent in an ambulance. Wow. And they had rigged up kind of a tent over her out of a bed sheet yeah. with sticks similar to kite sticks. If you are as old as I am, you know what that is. But they rigged this up where the sheets could not touch her body because 80% of all of her skin on her body had been burnt off. Mm. In that day and age, that was a death sentence. They had never even experimented at that time, I don't think, with growing that person's own skin in a yeah. Petri dish and putting it back on them. She had a death sentence mm. on her. Every doctor that saw her, she's going to die. They brought her up across the ramp. My dad turned to my brother and said, John, zoom in on this real close. I want this on, on film so we can show it on TV. Come on. He didn't say, I think this lady may get healed. We're going to pray and we're going to say, God, if it be your will. Yeah. He prayed for her and said, be ye healed right now. Mm. And God healed her. Wow. John was up on the scaffolding filming it. He said that it was like watching a movie with special effects, but that in about a minute and a half to two minutes, all of the skin, before daddy prayed, when you looked at her, what you saw was red, raw meat. Mm. You didn't see an old wrinkled arm from an old man. You just saw raw meat. Daddy prayed for her and within two minutes that skin just moving over her body just like a fungus growing on a lake only it was brand new fresh baby skin all over her body. My brother John saw it. It affected him so radically that he passed out wow. and fell off the scaffolding and landed on his head and was laying there knocked out dead cold. My dad went over and prayed for him. He woke up, climbed back up on the scaffolding Come and on. kept filming. 
in the book where I t John talks about seeing that lady's skin grow back. The second one I talk about is when people ask Bob Chambach that same question. Yeah. He didn't talk about a miracle where he had prayed for somebody. He talked about a miracle that happened to a little boy mm. in Mobile, Alabama yes. that was healed of 23 things. Any one of the 23 was bad enough and serious enough to kill him. Yeah. God kept him alive till daddy got to town. He went to church and walked home. Mm. He was totally healed, 100%. And that's what Bob Schambach would tell about every single time. And he got asked that question, what's the greatest miracle you ever saw? He got asked that thousands of times. Yes. And that was the answer he always gave. Yeah. And when I'm asked that, I talk about a guy that I grew up with named Ronnie Coyne. He had knocked one eye out with a wire. Mm. The doctor said they had to take that eyeball out because it was getting infected. If they didn't take it out, that infection would get in his other eye and he'd be totally blind. There was a lady evangelist came and set up a tent in their little town in Oklahoma. At the beginning of the meeting, he went up to the altar call and got saved. Yeah. Toward the end of the meeting, she said at the end of the service, anybody that wants to be prayed for, if you're sick, if you've got something you need to be prayed for, come up here now and we'll form a prayer line here and we'll pray for you. And God is going to heal you. Ronnie got up and went down there. He had a cold. Yeah. He didn't go down there. He was, he was adjusted to the idea that he would be blind in one eye for the rest of his life. He didn't even think about asking her to pray for that. What he asked to be prayed for was to heal the cold because he knew that could be healed. And she prayed for him and then she looked in his eyes and she said, son, you've got something wrong with one of your eyes, don't you? He said, yes, ma'am, I can't see out of that eye. She said, well, God can heal you. Would you like to be able to see out of that eye? He said, yes. She prayed for him. She didn't know there wasn't an eyeball there. She didn't know she'd look into the, either a glass or a plastic eye. But she just prayed, God, heal this boy, give him sight, let him see right now. Ooh. Took her hand off, and at first it didn't make much difference, and then all of a sudden he started seeing some light. Then he could see a fuzzy image of a person, and within five minutes, he could read a driver's license covering up his, what they called his good eye. I always called the, bad, the one that was the glass eye his good eye. Ooh. That's what made him famous. It wasn't the other one. But they covered up his eye, and, and they had people walking across the, the line with the driver's license, and he'd read every one of them. His mother was down there absolutely going stir-crazy. She just, from what I've been told, what he told me, Ooh. is nobody ever acted like she did that night. Come on. And I can understand that, but that, to me, was the greatest miracle I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's because it was personal with me. He was my buddy, he was my friend. We ran around together all the time. Yeah. They would come and spend one weekend at our tent meeting every month for about 10, 12, maybe 13 years. Yeah. And even after he was not uh, coming to daddy's tent meetings, after daddy was dead, I would go where he was and, and we would spend time together and and we were we remained good friends mm. until he died. And um, yeah. so God, there is nothing mm. beyond God's ability to yeah. fix or repair or redo, whatever you want to call it. There is nothing beyond his reach. You know, I'm reminded of what the prophet Jeremiah says when he said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? There is nothing too hard for God. 
Amen. And you know, you, you brought up a couple things that I'd really like to touch back on because I believe it's going to strengthen the faith of those that are watching and those that are listening. When your friend came to be prayed for, you said that he had had a cold and was going to ask to be healed of the cold and had almost consigned himself to live with one eye. He had lost that eye through an accident and was wearing a glass eye. And so he came to prayer for the easy thing, for the, what he think, thought was the simple thing, Absolutely. the cold. And he had almost resigned himself to having lived with that affliction of only one eye for the rest of his life. He would have served Jesus no. with just one eye. He, he didn't take thought that in his mind it wasn't possible to get a new eye and so he would just come and ask for the minor thing. I want to encourage everyone that's watching and listening. God is a God that loves you enough and is, a, is powerful enough and is available enough to you to not just do the easy thing, but he's the God of the hard thing. And he came not even asking for the eye to be healed. He, he came for a cold and still God is miracle because he's the God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. And so those that are listening, I really want to encourage you to believe God, you know, for, for that thing that you've given up on. You know, when Lazarus was put in the tomb, they came to Jesus and they said, My, come, to, come and heal your friend. He's sick. And Jesus said, if you'll believe and not doubt, you'll see the glory of God. Well, four days later, it seemed like Jesus took forever to get there. He died. They gave up on the promise of God, put him in a tomb. Jesus gets there and weeps because of their unbelief. And he said, where's Lazarus? And they said, well, he's already died. We put him in the tomb. Jesus says, take me to the place where you've laid him. I want to encourage those that are listening, those that are watching right now, to take God to the place where you've laid him. Take him to the place where you had a word from God before, but you gave up because it seemed like it took too long to come to you. It seemed like it wouldn't be available, or it seemed like it was too hard of a thing for God to do. But Jesus is standing there right now in your midst, asking you through the Holy Ghost, take him to the place where you've laid it, to the place where you've stopped praying about it, to the place where you've stopped believing God for it, to that tomb where you put that marriage, that financial situation, that doctor's report, and consign yourself that you'd never get a breakthrough, you'd never get a miracle. We have a miracle working Jesus who is available right here where we are at in Miracle Valley, but right there in your home as well, if you would only believe him. And it leads us into what your father said when you, you talked about the woman coming in on the hospital bed and she had the, she had the tent over her that, that wasn't allowed to touch her skin because of the burn and, and, and the, the misery and pain she must have been in, surely. He said, put the camera on her you're going to want to catch this. She's going to be healed. He didn't say if God heals her. He didn't say he might heal her. He said he would heal her. There's a difference between believing God is able and believing he will. Believing God is able is great. We must all believe he's able. But you can't stop your faith at God is able. Faith is consummated in God will. Faith understands that we have a word from God and God will do exactly what he said he'll do. And so that really stirred my heart when you said that your father turned to your brother and said, get this on camera. God's going to heal this woman. And he did. And the power of God touched her and skin instantly grew on her body before the eyes of thousands of people. I mean, it, it freaked out your brother so, so much that he fell, yeah. fell and hit his head. And for all intents and purposes was probably even dead. And could, then your father prayed been. for him. And, and by the power of God, he was raised up. We told him for years after that that what was wrong with him was he landed on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And so, you know, we could go on and on and on throughout the 1950s, the 1960s, and into 1970, your father would put this tent up, would preach in auditoriums, packed out by the thousands. People would come, ambulances would unload the sick, wheelchairs would be emptied every night, People would have eyes growing into their socket, tumors disappearing off of their bodies, cancer falling off. Um, there was a woman that came that I read that I'd heard a report of by a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, who was there. He said, I watched Brother Allen pray for a woman who was obese. She desperately needed God to touch her. 
and he prayed for her and I watched 65 pounds of flesh disappear off of her body in an instant before the crowd of people. I mean, those were the kind of signs and wonders and miracles that would be wrought by the hand of God on a regular basis. And the amazing thing is that there was nothing. Mm. I mean, the word nothing covers a broad yeah. prairie. But there was nothing that people did not come to the tent to be prayed for. Yeah. I mean, th there was nothing. I have a good friend. He's an Indian. He's an artist that lives up in the Four Corners area, um, which is where Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, or uh, Utah, all meet at the same spot down there. He's an artist. His dad was a medicine man. He was being trained to be a medicine man. His dad was filled with demons. His mother was filled with demons. There was a picture on Miracle Magazine on the front cover. When daddy prayed for his mother, she stepped on, or she probably would have already been on that prayer ramp that came across the front. Daddy stepped down there and prayed for her. She leaned over the prayer ramp and spit up these things that looked like raw oysters. Yeah. And it was the demons coming out of her. Mm. People don't understand that demons are as real today yeah. as they were when Jesus was yeah. walking on the shores of Galilee. When Jesus went to the cemetery and cast the demons out of the man that was living in the cemetery and they went into the herd of swine they ran down the hill and drowned and the people got mad because he did it on a Sunday mm. you can't do that on come back Monday and do no oh. when God said it's time to do it yeah that's when God's time clock started running and that's when it was time for him that's to get right. healed and that's when he got healed yeah you say the scripture says that, and he did it on a Sunday. That's important because Jesus did it on the day when everybody else thought it was impossible. He did it on the day when everyone else said that he couldn't do it. And that's exactly when you're going to get your miracle. That's exactly why you're going to get your miracle. Jesus is going to do it on the Sunday, on this day, a Sunday, the day when the doctor said it could never happen, the day when your husband said it could never happen, the day when maybe... Your backslidden family members said it could never happen. Jesus did that miracle on a Sunday when the religious order of the day said he couldn't do it. When everybody else said it could never happen, he wanted to prove to them, not only is there nothing I cannot do, but there's also no barrier to what I cannot do. And Absolutely. your father, he walked in such a powerful deliverance anointing. We talk about the healing and the miracles a lot, but he did. He walked in a level of dominion and authority over demon power that few preachers have ever walked in. Well, I have to say something here. One of the questions I get asked almost, not every time, but almost every time I go somewhere and speak, is how many hours a day did your dad pray? Yeah. What was his prayer routine? Daddy, if he was asked that, would look right in somebody's eye and tell them, the Bible says, live in an attitude of prayer. Yeah. And that's what Daddy did. He did not spend 18 hours a day on his knees praying, but he lived his life in an attitude of prayer. And yeah. if we were if we were on the way from Dallas to L.A. for a meeting while he was driving across the desert, he wouldn't be sitting there holding the wheel with his eyes closed praying. Yeah. But in his heart and in his mind, he was in an attitude of prayer. Yeah. And that's when, when you're being quiet is when you can learn something. You never learn anything while you're talking. Mm. You learn by listening. That's right. And that's the same whether it's your fifth grade school teacher, your wife or your husband. Yeah. Or a doctor or your pastor or Christ. When you're listening, you're learning. 
you listen to the news. You learn, used to be, you'd learn what was going on. Nowadays, that's questionable. Come on. Yeah, that book that Brother Allen is talking about that he wrote is called In the Shadow of Greatness, Growing Up Allen. It's a wonderful book that he wrote, really um, bearing out what it was like to grow up in the Allen household. Um, this book is available through his website, through his ministry. We're going to put that um, address on the screen, the website information on the screen, so that you can write or contact um, Paul and ask and get yourself a copy of the book. Um, I know that it will bless you, will build your faith. There's many miracles laid out in this book. He goes through many of the miracles we talked about today, and there's some that we didn't talk about that are in this book. It talks about what it's like to grow up in that household, in that home, um, under the covering of, of A. A. Allen, and what he was like as a father, what he was like as a preacher of the gospel. Um, and that book is really going to bless you. And I believe um, the address, if you want to write and get yourself a copy or find out more information, you can write to 7735 North Star Grass, Tucson, Arizona, 85741. You write to Reverend Paul Allen at 7735 North Star Grass, Tucson, Arizona, 85741. And we'll put the link on the screen. You can check it out there. Make sure you visit the website. You can find out more information about the ministry of A.A. Allen and about the ministry of Paul Allen as he goes through and really lists out that, um, really the story and the history, what it was like to grow up Allen. Uh, you know, today we've talked about so many powerful things and what God's done in those days. But most importantly, my heart burns for what God's doing in this day, what he's going to continue to do. If you only have the history to rely on, you're living an empty life. Yeah. The history is fine. We don't want to forget the history. And as you forget the history, you're bound to repeat all the bad things. But the main focus is the future. Yeah. What God's doing now, what he's going to be doing six weeks from now yeah. or a month from now or tomorrow afternoon. And in the book, there are over 110 pictures, 85% of which had never been published before this book was written. You know, when you mentioned that, Reverend Allen may be in the ground. His body may be in the ground right now in this, in this tomb behind us. His bones might be in that. But he's very much alive and not dead, walking the streets of gold right now in the very presence of God. But the God of A.A. A. Allen is very much alive for you today. While his body may be dead, that anointing that A.A. A. Allen carried is alive on this earth today. And that power is available to you right where you are. Lester Summerall used to teach us that no true anointing ever leaves the earth. It's available to a generation who is willing to pick it up by faith. And I believe that the power of God that was an operation through A.A. A. Allen's ministry is available to you right now, right here where you are. And I believe that many of you listening, many of you watching this broadcast are in desperate need for an encounter with God. You're in desperate need for a miracle. Maybe you can't hear out of your ears. Maybe your eyes have a problem. Maybe you've got a doctor's report and it's cancer, it's heart disease, or whatever it may be. I believe by faith right now as you watch the anointing of God be released into your home. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed in your heart, be delivered in your body, be healed from every foul spirit of infirmity. May that spirit be driven out now in Jesus' name. May you be healed now by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And we release by faith into your home, into your house, into your family, into your children right now, that very same anointing that destroys every yoke and removes every burden. Be delivered and be healed in Jesus' name. I want to thank every one of you watching so much for watching and tuning into the Voice of Revival television broadcast. Make sure you send us your prayer requests. You can reach out to us at www.revivalfirewm.com. Click the prayer link, send us your prayer requests. 
we're going to come into agreement and believe God to touch you at the point of your need. If you've got a praise request, we definitely want to hear from you. You can write to us or reach out to us through the website. You want to write to us, reach out to us at RFWM, P.O. Box 5444, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, or RevivalFireWM.com. Until next time, this is Chad McDonald. For those that are listening to the podcast right now, I want to thank you for tuning in and listening wherever it is you get your podcasts. I'm here with Reverend Paul Allen. We've been talking about A.A. Allen, and I want you to know that Jesus Christ is available to you right there where you are. This is the Voice of Revival, the place where miracles still happen. I'll talk to you next time.